have an evening off. Perfect for some telly tea and biscuits. I wonder what's on. Christ, this is still running, is it? I wonder if Taryn's still doing it. A rerun. Oh, that explains it. Question number nine is for 16,000. Andy, I know you will know this blindfold, but I will warn you that if you gave me a wrong answer at this point, you would lose £7,000. You're only actually guaranteed £1,000 at this moment. But you do have a 50 50. Good luck, Andy. Which is the in the name of the French variant of Pig Solitaire? An even temperament? Junior Farkas? A knife? Or a pagoda? Why are you grinning at me? Because I haven't got a clue. Ah, <laughs> so hysteria. <laughs> uh, well, you can get rid of two and then see how brave you feel. Um, well, as it's there, I'll, I'll play with you. Steady on, not so fast, Andy. Right. Computer, take away two random wrong answers. Leave Andy the right answer and the one remaining wrong answer. It was at this point that I awoke from what was clearly a fever dream. But still, something didn't feel right. This was going to need further investigations. Why on earth would you need a knife or an even temperament to solve the French variant of Peg Solitaire? And which of a legendary Hungarian mathematician or a pagoda would be of the least use for this task? But one thing at a time. First, more biscuits. Since the earliest written record of Peg Solitaire appears in the notes of Gottfried Leibniz, then Choco Leibniz seems the obvious choice. But back to the task at hand. Fortunately, Peg Solitaire is a one-player game. It's played on a board built out of squares. Boards come in different shapes and sizes, but the French variant looks like this. The game starts with pegs, or in our case, biscuits, in each of the squares except the central one. And the aim of the game is to make moves until there's only a single peg or biscuit left in the central square. Moves are made rather like in drafts or checkers in that you can jump a peg over a neighboring peg into an empty square, but only horizontal and vertical moves are allowed, no diagonal jumps. I remember playing peg solitaire as a kid, but on the English board. It was fiendishly difficult, but I got there in the end. Time to tackle the French board. How hard can it be? some help. Andy may have blown his phone a friend, but not me. Let's see. French contacts. French contacts. Ah. Okay. Let's see what old Richard has to say. <laughs> what can I help you with now, Englishman? Hello, Richard. How are you doing? Okay, I'll uh, get straight to the point. Um, could I get your help solving the French variant of Peg Solitaire? Typical Englishman. He thinks he could just solve the French variant of Peg Solitaire. C'est impossible, mon ami. Impossible? What do you mean impossible? It's a rather elegant parity argument, I believe. Um, ah oui, yeah. Color uh, two by two reds with some blue. Keeps the parity of the blue through the moves. You start even, you must end on, c'est impossible. Impossible? Annoyingly, Richard's right. You have to be a little bit careful about how you colour in your initial 2x2 two two grid. Here's a way that works. It's not the only one, though. Let's imagine we make a move with a pair of pieces starting on these two squares, since neither of the squares covered by pieces before the move is blue, as long as we don't colour the finishing square blue, the number of blue squares covered by pieces is conserved throughout the move. We can continue colouring in the board this way, 
If the pieces before the move cover exactly one blue square, color the finishing square blue. If neither of the initial squares is blue, don't color the finishing square blue. We can keep going like this for a while, but eventually have to decide what to do with both of the initial squares are blue. It's now no longer possible to finish with the same number of covered blue squares as we started with. But if we decide to not color the finishing square blue, the number of blue squares has been reduced by two, which is an even number. Following this rule, we can now color in the entire board. This little coloring rule is actually rather miraculous. It doesn't matter how we try to make moves on the board. The number of covered blue squares either stays the same or goes down by two. This is what Richard meant by preserving the parity of the blue squares through the moves. So what does this tell us about solving the French variant of peg solitaire? Well, at the start of the game, we have pegs in every square except the central one, and our objective is to finish with just a single peg in the centre. But if we stop and count up the number of blue squares covered by pegs at the start, we see that it's an even number. And because of how our colouring works, no matter how we make moves, the number of blue squares covered by pegs will always remain even. And so the French variant of peg solitaire cannot be solved because the configuration we want to arrive in covers an odd number of blue squares. Well, how on earth, then, are we going to solve Chris Tarrant's millionaire riddle and avoid having to take the money like Andy? Clearly, we're going to have to start using our even temperament and knife to start breaking the rules of the game, but which rules to break? We could forget that we have to move pegs into empty squares, but this doesn't seem to help because we'll still end up with an even number of pegs on blue squares. Even using negative pegs doesn't make a difference. If only there was a way to end up with an even number of pegs in our target configuration. I suppose we could try to finish the game with two pegs in the central square. This would give the game an even temperament, but what about the knife? Knives are good for chopping things up, not peg solitaire. We could start chopping the pegs up. That at least would be quite satisfying. But what if we chopped all the pegs up, chopped them in half? Then we'd start and finish with an even number of pegs, or half pegs, covering blue squares. Oh, this has got to be worth trying. Plus, it's an excellent excuse to get more biscuits. We'll worry about Julia Farker and the pagodas later.